amazing speakers. Crazy amazing. So thank you to Robin, wherever you are. Robin Spencer for putting this on. It's just been absolutely incredible. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Amy Horneman, aka The Thyroid Fixer. And I'll tell you more about me in a second, but we are going to be talking about healing your Hashimoto's with keto today. So I want to know more about you guys. You have to tell me. It's coming up on here, not there. You got that? Okay. How many of you, show of hands, suffering with weight gain, inability to lose weight, you can't poop every day. You're tired. 2 p.m. The couch is looking really good. Hair loss. Hands. 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 There you go. <laughs> I want to know about you guys. All right. Question two. That was real quick. How many of you know that you have a thyroid problem? You've been diagnosed, or maybe you're a practitioner working with people with thyroid problems. Okay, you've been diagnosed, and then how many of you have read, seen, or heard that keto is bad for the thyroid? It's bad, right? That's why you're here. We're going to break that down. Now, at some point in time, before Chris Rock got punched in the face by Will Smith, he had a fantastic quote. His quote about money. We're going to do it about keto. So, keto doesn't guarantee happiness, it guarantees options. So I'm going to give you options today of how to change your health, improve your thyroid function, actually lose weight, actually poop every day. So I want you to imagine actually healing your Hashimoto's with keto. I want you to imagine, you know, all the naysayers, you guys say, yeah, I heard it's bad, people say it's bad. I want you to actually imagine the look on those naysayers' faces when you lose 20 pounds healing your Hashimoto's with keto. Just think about that. Because all these people did. Janet, Brittany, Renee, I'm gonna tell you about them in a second. You need to know more about me though first, because I've been there done that. No? Oh my gosh, these really suck. Okay, so I have the credentials, I have the experience with my own struggle, and patient outcome. I have been in this business working one on one with thyroid patients for 27 years. Thousands of thyroids have been optimized, including my own. So I'm coming to you with experience, but I've also been there, done that. So I was an NPC figure competitor, this is years ago. Fitness model, I powerlifted, love that. But that wasn't easy because I was a fat kid. So back in sixth grade, my friend Beth and I would have competitions, sixth grade, of who could lose the most weight. I was doing Jane Fonda workouts in my parents' living room, getting up early in eighth grade. I was always a fat kid. I had to bust my ass for each and every photo shoot, each and every competition. It wasn't easy, but I did it. Except one time. It was a, it was an NPC figure competition in Pittsburgh. It was NPC Pittsburgh. If any of you compete or have competed, huge show, huge show. Pros are up there. The pressure is on. I was getting ready. I was doing all the things. I was going to the gym twice a day. I was eating chicken, broccoli, asparagus, lunches. And the weight was going up. The scale was going up. 10 pounds a month, 20 pounds in two months. Once I hit 25 plus pounds, I stopped weighing myself. I just stopped. But I did what we all do. I went to my doctor, first doctor. I go, oh my God, I'm gaining this weight. What the hell's wrong? You're normal, everything is fine. Anybody you get that? Do you get that with my thyroid people on here? Do you think you're normal? Uh -huh. Yeah. We can talk about testing all day long, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. Second doctor, you're just looking for something to be wrong with you. Well, yeah, I was. Because I was praying for a diagnosis so someone could tell me what is going on with my body. Why am I putting on weight when I'm doing all of the things? Doctor number three, I'm in my 20s now. You're just getting older. You're just getting older. Yeah. Oh yeah. The best one is this one. Eat less and exercise more. Like, Do you know what I'm eating? <laughs> See, I brought in paper actually. I brought my doctor in my diet. The chicken, the broccoli, the asparagus. Going to the gym twice a day. Just you blew me off. You're fine. Just eat less and exercise more. Last one was the call in your head. Now I'm on doctor number one, two, three, four, 
four, five, five. Five misdiagnoses, five blow-offs. Doctor number six finally diagnosed me, and I was like, hmm, yes, I have a name for this thing now, and I have a pill. And I have a pill that is gonna work. <laughs> no. That pill did not work, I did not lose one pound, and this was truly, if I had a picture of me, I would put it up there, I was crying in my car. I put my head down, I remember bawling, just praying to God that somebody had an answer for me, because no, none of the doctors I saw did. So somebody out there had to. I fell into a depression, despair, I was being judged, I felt shameful when I went to the gym, because I was wearing big heavy sweatshirts to cover up the weight that I gained, because I was supposed to be the fitness model. I was supposed to be the bigger competitor, but I was overweight and I couldn't take it off. So what do people do? Oh, you're lazy. You're just not working hard enough. You're cheating too much. So you start to take that on like it's your fault. And the medical gaslighting that I have up there, that's the doctors telling you, basically, it's your fault. It's your fault. You can be doing more. You can eat less and exercise more, right? So that's my story, that's why I'm here. What brought me into the functional space, really what brought me into the functional space was finding a functional doctor, like myself, this is what I do with patients now, who listened, who asked those four important words, how do you feel? How many, how many people's doctors ask those? Uh, yeah, nobody. <laughs> ask how I felt, got me on the right supplements, got me on the right medication, did the right testing, and got me on the right diet, which changed it all. We're gonna talk about that, but I wanna go over the key points of thyroid just so you guys can know, so when we're, when we're really getting into how keto is gonna heal your Hashi, you can know what we're talking about, right? So thyroid gland, and I know those of you who have a thyroid problem know this, but you might actually explain your knowledge a little bit more. The thyroid is the master gland. It controls everything. If you can't lose weight, if you can't go to the bathroom, if you don't feel good, if you can't grow your hair, if your skin is dry, if your nails are breaking, it controls it all. It is the master gland. Now it makes two hormones, T4 and T3. Now we have to remember that T4 is inactive. You do not have one single receptor site on your cell for T4, but you do have them for T3. T3 is active. That's what gives us the metabolism. That's what gives us our energy to get through the day. But T4 has to convert to T3. So T3 is the important one to keep in mind here. Now when T4 tries to convert to T3, it has two paths to choose from. It can choose the path to convert to free T3, yay, happy cells. It can choose the path to convert to reverse T3, this is a test that y'all should have done, reverse T3, sad cells. Inflammation, reverse T3 is your anti-thyroid hormone. I always say it's like the bouncer at a club. You know, there's a big dude standing outside, looking at T3 going, but you're not getting in. You're not getting in there. So if reverse T3 is high, T3, your active thyroid hormone, cannot get into your cell. So important to remember that. We do not want high reverse T3. Now, T3 is awesome because it makes you that baddest human that you're meant to be. Turn there, T3. <laughs> you guys <are> <laughs> For those of us who are over 40. Uh, so let's get into the naysayers, the Debbie Downers, and the Karen Zakita. This is what you guys all hear. And listen, I'm going to tell you, I have heard that keto is bad for the thyroid from people that I really respect in the functional community. But we have to break it down and we have to use science. So the naysayers, they say that being in ketosis will lead to accumulated acidity, which leads to inflammation. How many of you guys are keto? Have been doing keto for more than two weeks. You inflamed? Probably not. When you're doing keto and you're not like, kind of slipping off because we're in Austin and we eat tortillas. <laughs> right? When you're in ketosis, you are less inflamed. So it makes me go, what? What do you mean about that? Doing keto with a fire pump is like putting gasoline on a fire. Like I said, these are from, I didn't quote the actual person, but these are from really brilliant, respectable people in the functional space. And again, we have to get to the science. The Debbie Downers associate eating fewer calories. Famine? Are you guys in a state of famine when you're eating keto? I'm eating the good fat, I'm eating avocados, I'm eating my meat. I am by no means famished, ever. Pretty much ever. And then there's the Karens. Stay above 
your carbs per day to maintain thyroid function. What would happen, what would happen to you guys if you went above 100 carbs every single day? Weight gain immediately. Inflammation, thyroid shuts down, we're gonna go into that. So we have to base it in science. I'm gonna ask you, does anyone know how many well-published studies from designed human trials actually show impaired thyroid function with a ketogenic diet? Can I look into this? None. Zero. There's not one single study to back up the naysayers. Not one. And here we have, you know, obviously, low carb induced hypothyroidism right here. <laughs> this is Julie. She's, this is meant to be funny. Because <laughs> you're gonna hear a quote from her later. She lost a crap ton of weight doing keto. Her thyroid totally improved. So yeah, absolutely, keto causes hypothyroidism, right? So keto equals, let's get into, I'm gonna tie this all together for you, so hang with me. Better testosterone. We know that eating that really good fat improves, increases your cholesterol to a good level. And cholesterol is a building block for testosterone. Now testosterone, I like to call it the GSP hormone, the get shit done hormone. <laughs> because without it, you're doing nothing. Ladies, testosterone, this is not just a dude hormone. This is very, very important for you and your body and your thyroid. Without testosterone, without enough testosterone, you are actually at a greater risk of Hashimoto's turning on. So Hashimoto's is like a switch. It's an autoimmune condition. Any autoimmune condition has a switch. So a lot of you ladies will be like, you know, it was after my second kid. It just all went to hell. It was after I went into menopause, perimenopause. There goes the weight gain, can't lose weight. That's because when we have a hormonal shift, specifically low testosterone, that Hashimoto switch turns on. So testosterone is actually very, very protective of the thyroid gland. And we can see it in different studies I'm gonna show you, just so you know. And again, this could be a whole other talk about optimal versus normal lab values. Men, you should never be below 600 for your total testosterone. I wouldn't let my 70 year old dad be below 600 for his testosterone. Ladies, you want over 50. And I know you're gonna look at your labs and you're gonna see the cutoff at 42. And you're gonna be flagged if you're 50. Total, not 50 and 80. Total testosterone 50. You're gonna be flagged if that is your optimal value for testosterone. Now here's a study. Now this was done on guys, but it still shows that when we give men exogenous testosterone and bring their levels up to an optimal level, it actually reduces Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It protects them. It actually helps them with their symptoms. Another study showed that total testosterone increased with the ketogenic diet and significant increase. And you guys have heard of uh, Thomas DeLauer, who's really popular on YouTube, right? He actually said, like, listen, when you see a 118 nanogram per deciliter increase in 11 weeks, that's pretty significant. That's saying something about the ketogenic diet increasing testosterone. So keto increases testosterone, testosterone protective of the thyroid. All right, let's keep going. More get shit done hormone equals more strength, more motivation to exercise. What do we know about exercise? It lowers insulin. So you've got the ketogenic diet with exercise lowering your insulin. That's fantastic. Because lower insulin levels equals less inflammation. We want less inflammation so that we can lower reverse T3, the balance with the club, the infant thyroid hormone. When you are in a state of inflammation, that reverse T3 goes up. And listen, it's built into our bodies, so it is a survival mechanism. If you're in the ICU, if you're in the ER, if you're injured, we want reverse T3 high, because that's your body saying, you know what, you have to survive. You don't need to burn fat, you don't need to grow your hair, you don't need to have energy, you need to lay here and heal. That's great, but that's the only time we want it high. I don't want reverse T3 high, I mean, you guys are trying to walk around and get life done, trying to work. So we want lower inflammation, lower insulin, so that we can have lower reverse T3, better conversion of that T4 to T3. We know that high insulin equals fat storage. You've heard experts this entire weekend talk about high insulin being type, type 3 diabetes is Alzheimer's, because now we're seeing a correlation between elevated insulin levels in the brain and the onset of Alzheimer's. 
I went through it with my mom, it was hell. If you've been through it, you know it's hell. So we have to do everything to prevent it. Part of that is keeping your insulin low. The other part is keeping your reverse T3 low. So if we lower reverse T3, we have that better conversion, whether you're on medication or you're not. You're just producing your own T4 and T3, you want that conversion to happen. All right, so let's go back. We're gonna take everything that we just pulled together, right? We're gonna go through the naysayers now. Let's review, being in ketosis leads to inflammation. We have the Debbie Downers associating eating keto with signs of famine, right? No. So we actually have a study that shows, and this is tied to Alzheimer's as well, but it shows that eating a ketogenic diet lowers your inflammation, and we can measure it. So there's something called CRP that we can actually test, and this is a measure of inflammation in the body. So C-reactive protein actually goes down dramatically in a low-carb ketogenic diet group compared to the usual care of the stat, stat diet, standard American diet. At one in two years, this wasn't a short study. This was a very long-term study that showed a decrease in inflammation. Decrease in inflammation equals less insulin, equals better conversion, lower reverse T3. Okay, here's that stain above 100 grams of carbon, which just freaks me out. I can't even imagine it, right? It's maintain the thyroid function. And again, Julie again. So let's get to her quote. In 2020, I lost 80 pounds doing keto and intermittent fasting. My thyroid labs were finally consistently in the correct range, meaning off the orange, because she's my patient. The pounds felt like they were melting off with little effort. The best part was that by removing all the grains, I was able to regulate my autoimmune condition, Hashimoto's, on keto, high fat, my brain worked amazing. My energy for life was abundant. I had the energy to clean, plan, and play. I love that. Clean, plan, and play. I felt my life had vitality. When you have thyroid issues, you forget what living is. You don't know how good it can be, and that is so true. Because if you're walking around with a non-optimized thyroid, you are low. You are like, oh, I can't get through the day. I don't have zest for life. This sucks. And I was there. I was there in that despair, so I get it. But when you change things up, when you get optimized, when you lower inflammation, when you improve that T4 to T3 conversion, when you have more GSD hormone, now life is good. Now you're getting shit done every day. Now you feel good. Now you can plan and play. Do you always have to ask, does it biologically make sense? I, I say this a lot in my podcast, the Thyroid Fixer podcast. Whenever faced with a question, does it biologically make sense? We just went through studies showing that doing keto increases testosterone. Testosterone, you want to exercise. Ooh, but paired up with that, keto lowers insulin. So we have two things to lower insulin. Lower insulin equals less inflammation. Less inflammation equals better conversion, better thyroid hormone. So how can we even say at all that the keto diet is bad for the thyroid? We just tied together with science. There are no studies that show that being in ketosis or doing a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet, whatever you want to call it, is bad for the thyroid. Zero studies, but I just showed you multiple studies and there could be 10 more slides on that, of real science tying all this together. So I want to give you actual real examples of, of success stories. These are my patients. You saw them earlier. This is Renee. Renee actually improved her inflammation. So Renee, obviously big body transformation change, but there was more to it than that. She couldn't hold a pen. Her joints were so inflamed that she couldn't hold a pen. And you know, she thought, oh, well, you know, I'm just getting older. This is just what happens. Maybe it's like rheumatoid arthritis. But when we actually decrease her inflammation, optimize her thyroid, she could hold the pen again. She had no idea that it was connected, but it was one of those symptoms that improved when we optimized her. Absolutely amazing. And then of course, she lost a ton of weight. Second objection, Brittany. Brittany also competes, and by no means was she ever in a state of famine. She has muscles, she has legs, but very much like me, she wasn't happy. She started gaining weight like crazy, no matter what she did. We 
We tested her thyroid and we found that issue that it wasn't optimized. Yes, we got her on the right medication, but we also implemented a ketogenic diet even when competing. So very similar to what Debbie Koss was talking about, you can absolutely be in ketosis and be an athlete at the same time. And she is living proof. She was never in a state of famine. Now this is Janet. And I have some of you that that's an old picture. That's because Janet would not, she never took a picture from the first one to the second one because she was consistently overweight. So she saw herself in that first picture, it was like, I wanna say she told me it was like 1990. She saw herself in that first picture and she was disgusted, depressed. No one was helping her. Doctors didn't help her at all. Never told her to, to do keto, never told her to do low carb, never even found that she was insulin resistant until we started working together. Optimized her thyroid, got her into ketosis, and she finally took a picture again. And that's her after. And she's been that way ever since. I worked with her probably five years ago. She's been that way ever since. So how I tell you to do keto the right way without tanking your thyroid, I, I do have a program called Keto for the Week. You guys can go to my website and find it, but let's talk about it. Very similar to what Ben talks about, Azadi. Very similar to what Debbie Potts just talked about. Cycle, cycle. So if you stayed in ketosis, like 20 grams or less, day after day, never breaking it, month after month, year after year, could your T3 levels drop a little bit? Yeah, maybe. Just come out of it. Have fun on the weekend. Pick one day. Do keto for the week. But pick one day on the weekend and have what you want to have. Have a sweet potato. Have some more hot chocolate. <laughs> have all of those keto treats downstairs, which are amazing, but I ate too many of them. <laughs> have something fun that you really enjoy so you can actually come out of ketosis on the weekend. That's all you need. Break it one time, one time on the weekend, come up on out of it, and your thyroid will be absolutely fine. Because we're going to lower inflammation, which increases conversion, decreases reverse T3, increases free T3, increases your get you done more well. It's all good, and that's how it all works together. Science. So ask, does it biologically make sense? When you hear the keto is bad for the thyroid, you start thinking, because I know you all do this. Maybe I should do that. My doctor told me to do low fats. Maybe I should do that. And you start doing three different diets in a week, right? Like one day you're, you're vegan, and then the next day you're high carb, low fat, right? The other day you're in keto. Do it consistently, come up one time on the weekend to break out of ketosis, and then go right back into it. Now what will happen as that inflammation goes down, you're gonna become more fat adapted. You heard that term over and over again this weekend? Metabolically efficient, fat adapted. And then when you do come out of it on the weekend, no big deal. Because by Monday, you'll be back in ketosis. You'll be burning fat like a maniac. And that's what we want. Thyroid function up, working well, testosterone up, it's awesome, motivation, strength, and you're losing weight. And you're feeling better. And if you don't have that brain fog, and you're pooping every day. <laughs> So yes, we can, can, can use keto to heal your Hashimoto's. This is where you guys can find me, but I really want to get into questions, but I love answering your questions. I love that even more than just standing here spewing information. So I want to hear from you now. Yes? Um, my doctor says I need to give up dairy. Okay. My what do you think about that? Every single person is different. So with dairy, the question was, do I have to give up dairy? Her doctor told her to. With dairy, I always say go for those high quality dairies. You know, get some grass fed cheese, um, raw milk cheddar, Kerrygold. You know, do that kind of really good quality dairy. And I think you can find a balance. So on the one hand, if we follow keto recipes, right? We're using a block of cream cheese and a block of mozzarella cheese, and then we're sprinkling some cheese on everything and we're chunking off the cheese. Okay, maybe that can be a little bit too much because there's a connection between dairy, gluten, and autoimmune. Dr. Peter Osborne talks about that a lot in his book, No Brain, No Pain. So we do see a little bit of an increase in antibodies, thyroid antibodies from Hashimoto's with dairy, but that's the people that are doing the bad dairy, the cream cheese, and they're drinking milk, and they're pouring milk on their cereal. 
If you do the high quality, you'll be fine. And then it comes down to you as a person. Does it bother your stomach? You know, if every time you eat a piece of grass-fed cheese, you get your ass, maybe that's not right for you. But if you're fine, then keep doing it. Because that way you can enjoy life. You know, you can actually have some things in your diet that you love to love cheese. So you don't have to go with the vegan cheese. You can actually do it with cheese. Yes? So you still have some of your patients on thyroid medication. Oh, yeah. As long as it's not um, a big step. Yeah. And what, what do you think about um, ashwagandha? Oh, too, that's a good question. I love it. Okay, so first of all, when we're optimized on thyroid, I want you to think of thyroid medication as thyroid hormone replacement therapy. Don't put it in the same class of medication as like the band-aid ones, the statins, the antidepressants, right? Because that's in this category. Thyroid hormone replacement therapy would be the same thing as if you were a type 1 diabetic and you were taking insulin and you needed that insulin to survive, but you said to me, I don't know if I can't medication. Oh no, you have to take it. You have to take this. So same thing, thyroid hormone, in doing keto, we are going to improve your overall thyroid function. We're going to improve how that medication, if you are on medication, works. Because we want to improve that conversion. Because most of you, if you're on medication, you're on T4. Maybe you're on NDT. But most of you are on T4. So that T4, remember, inactive, it has to convert over to T3. So I'm not saying do keto and get off your medication. I'm saying do keto and actually improve how that medication is working or how your thyroid is working in and of itself. So yeah, if you, you absolutely want to incorporate both. I'm on thyroid meds. 100% of me, I'm on thyroid meds on for 20 some years. However, if I did not do keto, the thyroid meds are not a safety net. You know, they're not gonna prevent me from gaining weight and being tired and losing my hair and having dry skin. So it's, it's the combination, it's the both hand. I talk about both, if you listen to my podcast, you'll hear me say both hand, both hand. We can't just throw the thyroid medication at you and you go to McDonald's, that's not gonna work. I also can't just do a diet with you, but your thyroid hormones are all up. Both hands, they work together. Ashwagandha, your question. If you don't know your core cell function, don't just take ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is a big one that you know you see on Facebook and you see a post and you see it here and people talk about it or supplements and you buy them. Ashwagandha can raise cortisol. I know it's an adaptogen, but it can, I've seen it raise cortisol levels. So a lot of times my thyroid patients will have high cortisol because they're all stressed out. They've been trying to deal with this condition forever. They've been trying to lose weight and trying to feel better and they don't, so their stress levels increase. So we'll see high cortisol levels when we do a salivary cortisol test. We want to see that pattern. We want to see it high in the morning and drop down and go low in the afternoon. So we don't want to be taking ashwagandha and potentially pushing those levels higher. Because high cortisol, that T4 to T3 conversion, I always say it's like only 10 tough mothers. It is tough for your body to do. And there are a laundry list of things that can interfere with it. So we want to make that, that, that conversion really smooth and having proper cortisol levels as a part of that. Um, yeah, my uh, practitioner had said that my um, autoimmune was kind of eating at my thyroid mm -hmm. and ashwagandha would help. And so I take one every day. Mm -hmm. that okay. Test your cortisol first. <coughs> ashwagandha is not going to save your thyroid. Your, your body, so um, she says her doctor told her her body's like eating away her thyroid, which is correct. If you have Hashimoto's, you know those antibodies that they test for, TPO and TGA antibodies. You look at those antibodies and think of them as soldiers. They're soldiers that are going out and they're beating up your thyroid gland, and they are slowly destroying it. So when we look at the thyroid with Hashimoto's on an ultrasound, we'll see it kind of funky and jagged edge because it's being beat up every day. Ultimately, we want to stop that. We don't, we don't want your thyroid beat up every day. We want working well, but ashwagandha is not going to do that. Going gluten free well, doing keto well because you're reducing inflammation. Proper thyroid hormone replacement therapy will help, but ashwagandha is not. That's not even in the realm of things that I would say would stop the destruction of your thyroid. Because I'm, I'm taking thyroid pills, and then that was an addition to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you're taking, so I actually have a whole supplement line. It's called the Fixer Supplement Line. It's on my website, and actually, if you have 
the, the cars that are being passed around, you can grab them when you walk out too. Um, there's a QR code on it so you can get to it. So I have a, a product called the Feather Fixer. And that is T2. Now again, that could be another half an hour discussion on T2. My recent podcast, I'm just telling the state, my recent podcast that was released on Friday is all the science behind T2. That I would add in to stop the, the destruction, lose fat, feel better, um, improve cortisol function, but I would not personally, with my patients, I would not add in ashwagandha unless they were low. Like show me really low cortisol, then we can add that in because it's gonna kind of bump it up a little bit. But I wouldn't just throw it in really nilly. Yes. Hi. Um, I think about immunity uh, and gut issue generally, like you know, autoimmune response from the gut. So when I look at thyroid versus Crohn's, it's, I kind of have a similar mindset. That's a big root cause. Mm -hmm. Do you ever like when it's the antibody is extremely high? Um, I don't want to waste time trying different diets. Do you ever go to like carnivore elimination that would help? Because sometimes you don't know which vegetables are causing. Yeah. Food. If you're willing, heck yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've had some patients come to me actually on carnivore, doing full carnivore. And they still needed the, we didn't have to obviously change their diet, they needed the thyroid hormone replacement and the hormone stuff. But they, they reported feeling amazing and when we looked at their antibodies, they were either low or zero. So 100%, if you have any autoimmune condition, any, 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 gluten-free is number one, have to, have to, have to, have to, have to, being gluten free. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, doing the carnivore diet would, would improve things tenfold if you can do it. You know? I know there's alcohol today. Like, I have people who drink regularly, wine, things like that. I don't know. I usually don't stop. I don't know. So, alcohol, alcohol. I know, you know, we, listen, I, I had some tequila and club soda and wine last night. <laughs> but if I am trying, like, if I am in a state or I'm working with someone where their main thing is wait, Damn, wait, it won't come up. I'm doing it all. And I go, you know what? Can we just take out alcohol, even the keto alcohol, for like a good four or six weeks? Because alcohol will stop the fat burning process. You have proteins, carbs, fats, alcohols. So your body sees alcohol as this bad guy. Like, oh, we don't want it in there. We gotta take it out. We gotta metabolize it. We gotta push it out. So it will stop processing proteins, carbs, and fats in order to process that alcohol. So ultimately, I say no. But once you're optimized, then go ahead and add it in here and there. Yes, ma'am. Um, is there a difference, or what is the difference between Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism? Thank you. Thank you. So, if we take hypothyroidism, just that big term, low thyroid function, 95% of all hypothyroid cases are Hashimoto's. So chances are pretty good that you have Hashimoto's. I was on Cynthia Thurlow's podcast a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. And we were talking, and she actually said what I always say, you don't have to have antibodies to demon Hashimoto's. So she's never shown up with positive antibodies, and she goes, you know, I know I'm Hashi because I have other autoimmune, there's autoimmune in my family. And yeah, it could be just be the process of elimination, or just the fact that 95% of all hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's. But she needs to learn from you, yeah, that's what you have, even if you didn't test positive for antibodies. And antibodies will often come up as a false negative. So we always want to test, test, and retest. It's not a one-time test and no, you're good, you, you don't have Hashimoto's. It's test, test, and retest. And part two of that is when I'm talking about optimal lab values, I really dive into this point. I want antibodies at zero. Not five, not nine, not 30, zero. Yes, out of five? Yeah, okay. I do have a question. Yeah. First of all, oh. so you have this, and all y'all have labs, so you can all grab them when you're at home. Actually, if you, on those cards, there's also a, a, a challenge, it's a seven day heal your Hashi with keto challenge. I think we have a lab values in there. But it, when you're looking at your labs, that standard lab value range that you see on there was taken from a very huge, sick population. So Mark Hyman says it best that if if this was a side of the barn, and I gave you a ball, and I said hit this side of the barn, you're probably going to hit it. That's the standard lab value range. If I put a bullseye on the side of the barn, and then tell you to hit it, that's a whole other story. You may or may not. 
but that's optimal. That's where in functional medicine we say, we took labs from the fit people, from the healthy people, from the optimized people, and that's where we got our optimal lab value ranges. So functional medicine lab value ranges are much more narrow, and it's very important to not only get all of the labs done that you need, but also to fall into that optimal range. Very, very important. For someone like me, I was diagnosed with Hashi's initially 25 years ago. Um, I've had extremely high TPO, over 10,000 oh. at one point. Um, was really proud of myself when I got it under 500. Yeah. Uh, and that was doing the AIP protocol for a couple years, which was miserable. Um, someone like me that's had it for so long, can you get your TPO to zero? Yes, and. So yes and yes, we can work at getting that down 100%. I like to find what is triggering those antibodies to rise. Yeah. And there's so many different things. It's been gluten free anyway. for 12 years now. I mean, I've yeah. done, and it's all, just I've done all the things, all but things. not keto consistently. And it could be hormones. So it could be yeah. a different stressor that is, is causing those antibodies to go up. But at the end of the day, and I have a podcast on this too, don't rely on your numbers. At the end of the day, so many people get focused on those antibodies. Yeah. And you're right, you do want to reduce those soldiers. But here's the thing, I have had patients with 500 TPO, but the free T3 is a 3.8, and the reverse T3 is less than 12, and they've lost weight, and they feel better, and then we go, do we really give a crap about your antibodies because you're living your best life? Sure. I don't care. And at the same time, I've had people with zero antibodies with elevated reverse T3, elevated inflammation, insulin resistance, low testosterone. Does it matter that they're zero? No. No, it's about getting you optimized as a person. It's about really working to go, okay, what do we have to change? We have to change your dose, we have to do this, we have to implement this, we have to test this, and getting you optimized. That's what I care about, how do you feel? Not a number, not a number. Yes, ma'am. Um, so a good friend of mine has Hashimoto's. She's been doing keto longer than me, so I know it's more than three and a half years. She's really good at following keto. She doesn't drink alcohol. She's tried, um, so she, I think she lost about 20 pounds, then she plateaued. She wants to lose, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 more pounds, um, some, something in there. She's real tall, she, um, so she's really good at following keto. And then she, she also has tried one meal a day. She's yeah. done intermittent fasting. She's also done like what you had mentioned earlier about you know maybe on the weekend, increasing carbs. And she's really frustrated because she's been not able to lose weight for a long time. Okay. Medication. It's going to come down to her numbers. It's going to come down to optimizing that med. Because again, if, if she's doing keto and she's doing all the things, and she's not experiencing the, the symptom relief, then we have to look deeper. We might have to you know, really test her reverse T3, make sure that something isn't mm -hmm. something else is go, isn't going on to elevate that. Low iron, low magnesium, low zinc, low iodine, estrogen dominance, uh, insulin resistance. I mean, the list goes on. Underlying inflammation. You know, maybe you have seen bar virus, that's a big trigger. So there might be other things going on, so I would want to test thoroughly and then possibly change up her medication. Add in some T2, add in the thyroid fixer, because that's just supplement that, that's on a prescription. Add that in, and then I think she would start really experiencing symptom relief. It's that whole little thing. It's a little thing. Yes. Um, I just went to my traditional doctor, and she told me that when I did my last lab that my T3 was a little bit higher than it should be. And I just was like, oh, okay. And I, I don't know what to do with that information, I guess. So what would be recommendations if somebody, like your doctor's likes or something a little off, but they, you don't have any other information? Are you on thyroid medication? No. You're not? Okay, so your, your T3 was high. Uh -huh. You sure it's your T3? Whatever, I think it was the T3. Okay, so we have to look at all the labs like, together, right? So first we want to look at TSH. That's thyroid stimulating hormone. That's, that's the one that you're obviously going to get tested. Yeah. And then I would want to go down and see, because if you have an elevated reverse T3, remember the bouncer's at the club. Yeah. So he's not letting the T3 in. Right. So your free T3 could appear elevated on labs simply because it can't actually get into the cell. Uh -huh. So it would be for you, I would say, like, you could put the whole thing. Right. So where do I get started? I mean, where do you start learning? Just go to your website or? My website, my podcast, you can book a call to, if you want to okay. if you want to actually work together and find that, that out. Yeah, okay. 100%. I think I'm out of time, but I'm going to hang out and, and answer more questions. I want to grab just two more, because you had your hand before I was with you. Um, my daughter's eight weeks pregnant. Yes. With their levels of pregnancy. She also has a one and a half year old. So she's very tired, very pregnant. Her uh, TSH and her body was elevated. The doctor told her she has Hashimoto's. Yep. Is this typical for a pregnant woman? Will they go back down? Or is this something that she is now dealing with? It's probably something she's going to deal with the rest of her life because that pregnancy. 
turn that switch on. However, the most important thing I can tell you is that she has to get optimized while pregnant because the biggest cause of miscarriage is low thyroid function, the biggest cause of brain damage, like developmental delays, autism, brain damage, brain not forming properly, is low thyroid function. So the most, now that we know, now that we have the information, now we optimize her to make sure that she has a very healthy pregnancy, healthy baby. She's on medication. Yeah. Check, 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 check again, check again, 10 times, check again. She's getting everything Yeah. Okay, that's good. If you go to, um, gosh, we have this everywhere. I don't even think it's on my website. It's definitely on my Facebook page. Everywhere. We have an optimal lab value sheet, which I probably should have brought here too. I was giving you guys so much other stuff. I don't want to bombard you. We do have an optimal lab value sheet where you can actually check and see what the levels are. Yeah. Last question. So T2, first of all, it does not change thyroid hormone values, so it does have a negative feedback loop where it's going to shut down your own thyroid production. So people who don't have thyroid hormone can take T2 just to kind of improve their, their metabolism, it increases in basal metabolic rate. So my, my podcast uh, that was released on Friday does the deep dive, the science deep dive into it. So it doesn't affect actual thyroid function, it's going to increase your basal metabolic rate if you mass fat, you burn at rest. So there's no contraindications whether you're taking thyroid medication or not, you can still add in the T2. Because T2 is actually present in, in medication like Armour, NP, thyroid. So we have T2 in there. So you're just adding something that people on NUT already get. But in a, in a higher dosage to be more effective at raising that basal metabolic rate. And then your second question was oxalates. So that's really individualized. So again, orange oh, flower is not oxalate. Oh, don't make me cut out my almond flour. However, I think in small amounts, well I know, in small amounts most people can tolerate it, but you have those certain people that are prone to gout. Yeah, and you can even get gout, you know your thumb hurts, like your thumb joint up. That's gonna be high oxalate. So I will notice if I'm doing, and I don't do kale or spinach anymore, but if I'm doing a lot of almond flour and I'm baking and all that, I'll get you know, that thumb pain and then I don't have to back off of it. But it doesn't interfere with me being optimized, or even with patients that are being optimized. Okay, absolutely. You guys, I'll be, I'll, I'll hang out here. I can go outside if there's another speaker. But if you have more questions, then I can.